Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome back to another Dinner Break series. Good evening in Pakistan. I hope everyone is doing well. Blessings to you and your family. And I want to thank you again for joining us for another Dinner Break series. Now, November is another Dinner Break series that's going to come. And you know what it's going to be called? It's going to be called Thanks to Allah for Safety. And yes, we will actually be talking about the benefits of bringing Allah to work with you the benefits of how we serve other people in loving and accepting and supporting individuals uh, who are around us as though they are part of our family. So yes, next in November, November in the United States is a time for Thanksgiving. It is a time where we say thanks. And so there is no better month in my opinion than to say thanks uh, to Allah for being a part of safety. So I hope that you register for the Dinner Break series in November. I also hope that you share, you share the Dinner Break series uh, with everyone. I mean, send the link out, to get everybody you can to register. We have 200 slots available. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened in Pakistan. Right now, we have 177 people that registered for this event. But I believe because of Pakistan time, now you know what Pakistan time is, right? Pakistan time is never at eight o'clock in Pakistan. It's usually uh, sometime around 8.10, 8.15, but we do start at 8 p.m. Because right now we have approximately, out of 177 registered, we have 24 people online right now. Now, don't get me wrong, people are still coming in, but we start at 8 o'clock sharp. Uh, and so uh, do me a favor. If you know of individuals who may be interested in this information, please let them register uh, for the lunch break series, and we will put them in to the big uh, mail, um, uh, the the actual list, the mail list that we have, and that way they know on a monthly basis what events are available for them to attend. Today we're going to talk about laboratory preparedness and emergency response. And I've been doing this talk for ASM and for uh, the BioPrison family for many years now, but as many of you may know or may not know, I have a very long history in public health emergency response. It started with HIV AIDS and it went into waterborne disease and then it was September 11th and the terrorist attacks, whether it was the 9-11 the attacks or the anthrax attacks in the United States, I served on CDC's response team to both of those events. After that, when there was a SARS, H1N1, West Nile virus, monkeypox, any outbreak that occurred, I would go out and respond in that case as well. And then, of course, in 2014 with Ebola. So what I want to talk to you about is the laboratory preparedness and emergency response aspect. But I also want to make sure that you understand the human element of emergency response. What's going on in a human being when an emergency begins to occur? So first and foremost, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the boring stuff out of the way. You can either be proactive in your emergency response planning, or you can be reactive. That's up to you. It's a, you, you, you will be the one that gets to decide that. But in order to be proactive, you've got to have plans in place. And let me tell you the bare minimum that you should have in place for your laboratory environments. And again, I don't think that it matters whether it's a BSL-2, a BSL-3, or a BSL-4. I think when we talk about emergency preparedness, you've got to plan all the way around. Now, my hearts, my prayers, and yes, I'm even fasting for those who are living in the Kashmir region, all the challenges that are going on right now. I just pray for peace and prosperity and just a sense of normalcy for everybody that's living in those areas. I'm teaching a virtual master training program right now, and I know that those areas are very affected. And so if you're actually online listening to me right now, I'm glad that you have a chance to because I hear that it's very difficult this time. But I do want to let you know that when we talk about emergency planning, you should have plans in place for your, a loss of an agent, a theft, or a release of a biological agent. You should have a plan in place for when there are inventory discrepancies, meaning you go to look for something and you thought you had it and you don't have it. Um, security breaches, uh, severe weather and natural disasters, workplace violence, bomb threats, terrorism, and suspicious packages, emergencies including spills and needle sticks, unconscious individuals, emergency evacuations, gas leaks, power outages, and yes, even fires. 
you should have an incident response plan for each and every one of these. Now, Google is a beautiful tool. You could search for incident response plans in laboratories specific to these aspects, and you will find some. And I would definitely ask for you to really consider putting some of these incident response together and, and have something in place so and, and, and have something in place that you could refer to if and when an emergency does happen. Now, what should be in the plans, though? You know, we it's one thing to have a topic on what we write plans on, but what actually should be in the plans? Well, you should have your contact information, which should be updated on a frequent basis for laboratory, science, safety, animal, facility, and security aspects. All those individuals' contact information should be in your emergency response plans. You should also have roles and responsibilities. Who is doing what when this emergency happens and who's responsible for what? Because again, when an emergency happens, it's very, very important for us to understand that um, we're not going to be thinking like we normally do. Uh, we're going to be at, being asked to respond. Our cognitive capabilities are going to be limited because so much is going to be happening. So a good plan with good training will actually produce a good end result. You're going to have to also coordinate with local emergency responders. A laboratory can't respond to an emergency situation by itself all the time. Sometimes the capacity needed supersedes what the laboratory has. So you need to also coordinate with anybody on the outside that may be able to assist you during the emergency situation and plan and work with them. You should also train with them if you're going to be using them during an emergency. You need to have a location of your inventory. Where is it? What do you have in it? How much do you have in it? Because if at any given point during an emergency situation, you may have to communicate to emergency responders what you have. It may be unsafe for you to actually go into the laboratory environment, okay? You have to have a process for ensuring that you can secure the area and control the laboratory environment, as well as making sure that you can evacuate uh, the laboratory uh, environment and decontaminate the lab area if and when it is needed, okay, if and when it is needed. Now, what happens in Pakistan? One of the most important thing with laboratory emergency response is we kind of have to understand the environment in which we're working in. So what I did was I did a threat assessment. And when you do a threat assessment in Pakistan, you kind of learn, well, there's several floods and even earthquake territory aspects. Now, when we look at flooding, if you're in a flood area as shown on this map, and it's a very, very important that you prepare for floods, that your laboratory actually considers floods as a potential risk and incident or emergency situation that you need to prepare for. In addition, if you look at the threat analysis of earthquakes, uh, Pakistan in certain regions have very uh, important or very real um, uh, threat aspects from an earthquake standpoint. And so I think it's very, very important that we also prepare for earthquakes and we prepare our staff, uh, giving them a plan for what you do if and when an earthquake takes place. Okay, so if and when an earthquake takes place, what is it that we actually do? So floods and earthquakes, as all of you know, do occur in Pakistan. So we do have to consider those as incident response plans for emergency situations and lab environments. We also, believe it or not, I mean, there aren't so many tsunamis that occur, but a tsunami has occurred uh, once uh, or twice in Pakistan, uh, if you're on the coastal area. Um, and it, not only that, but we also have had some hurricanes that have hit. Not too many. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not something that uh, occurs on a, on a frequent basis, but we have, and, 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 and history has shown, that hurricanes can and do hit Pakistan. We also have terrorism. And now this is just a map of terrorist events that have occurred between 2012 and 2016. And as you can see, very, very important, uh, we do have events of terrorism that do occur. And so again, having a plan for what you do following a terrorist attack may be something that you want to include or, um, or address in your incident and emergency response planning. Now, how can we, that's, that's talking about what goes on in Pakistan, but how can we partner to become more prepared? Look, it's absolutely critical that if we do not partner with first responders and explain what we do in our laboratories, 
they will not be open to training with us. And worst of all, they may not be prepared to respond to us when an emergency begins. You have to realize that if you're preparing for emergencies, you're gonna have to forge partnerships between the laboratory staff and whoever is on the outside that's gonna be offering services to you. You have to. And so the, the reality is, is that what we propose that you do is in the United States and around the world, there's this thing called the incident command system. Now this incident command system is a kind of a plug it kind of plugs into the first responders, meaning when a first responder shows up to the side of a laboratory, they're going to have a lot of questions. And one person may not be able to answer all of those questions. So what we strongly recommend that you do is you form an incident command model. We call it the laboratory ICS model. And what that means is, is you make sure that you have a science director, a facility director, a safety director and an animal care director available uh, to report to the incident commander when they show up on scene because what they're going to ask is well okay what kind of science is being done in that lab the science director will be able to answer that they're going to be able to ask well how can we shut down the power or the hvac or uh, turn off the 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 security systems how do we do that that's where the facility director comes in the safety director is going to provide information for how to keep the first responders safe. What are the chemical threats? What are the radiological threats? What are the biological threats in there? And then last but not least is animals. Sometimes laboratories have animals in them and fire and police and first responders need to sometimes know about those animals as well. So the animal care director is going to be able to communicate where the animals are in the research, what they need to worry about, what happens if an animal gets out, how to deal with uh, animals in containment levels. Again, we cannot assume that we as laboratory professionals can respond to every single emergency. We are going to, to have to ask people. We're gonna have to ask for assistance. And if we ask for assistance, we better set up those relationships ahead of time rather than waiting for when an emergency occurs and then being sad that we had not prepared for that emergency situation. Okay, so how can we better prepare ourselves for emergency situations? Meaning, how can we better prepare the laboratory staff for emergency situations? Well, the first thing that we can do is understand exactly what goes on in emergency situations, okay? When an emergency situation occurs, our basic needs are challenged. What does that mean? We may have psychological needs, air, food, water, or physiological needs, air, food, water, and shelter. We may have a need for safety and security. We may have a need for belongingness. We're worried about people who we love getting hurt or who, you know, the organization we belong to being damaged. Um, and we may have this desire or this need to participate in the emergency response. But here's the point. And this is what I want to I point out. Whenever a basic need is challenged, your ability to rationally think and make decisions specific to risk and emergency situations becomes more limited. Why? Well, you have this need, so it produces this urge to behave and to respond. And unless you've adequately or accurately or even intentionally tried to train yourself to respond with that noise, you may actually be making the wrong decisions. You may actually produce an increase in risk as a result of a decrease in risk. Now, one of the things that I love about, uh, uh, about Islam, the religion, the practice of religion is the concept of fasting. Fasting deprives yourself intentionally of a physiological need. Now, when you're deprived of a physiological need, it produces noise. What does that mean? You become hungry. So you're hungry and, 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 and you're irritated and, and you're looking and you're wanting food. And the reality is, is you're still asked to perform even though, I mean, that's, that's that, you know, the weird part is when you, when you fast, we're not supposed to walk around. I fast every day except for Sunday. We're not supposed to walk around with a frown on our face and look hungry and, you know, oh, I'm fasting. This, that's not a legitimate fast. We're asked to fast and still perform at the highest level for a law that we can possibly perform for. That's what we're asked to do. That's fasting. And to remember those individuals that are hungry and to, uh, and to intentionally deprive ourselves of a basic need to control the mental noise that occurs 
as a result of a deprivation of that basic need. What happens in an emergency situation is the same thing. It, we are deprived of a need which produces this need to behave, and unless we address that need to behave, uh, it continues to produce the noise. When an emergency situation occurs, we have our, our cognitive abilities are limited and our, our need to behave is accelerated. And so the problem that we have is that sometimes we make big mistakes in emergencies if we are not adequately and properly trained. So I'm proposing a big part of preparedness is actually training. Repeated training leads to the formation of habits or an automatic response. Meaning, when we look at industries where life and death are on the line, the airline industry, military, um, fire, police, even nursing and doctor, they don't train people with PowerPoints. And they don't just throw people into a situation and say, well, you're a doctor now, or okay, you're a pilot, or you know what, you're in the military now. They don't do that. They make sure that they know what those individuals could encounter when an emergency situation occurs, and they train those individuals for responding appropriately for that emergency situation. Repeated training produces habits, and those habits then engage automatically when an emergency situation occurs. So I'm going to encourage you to have fun and to train in emergency situations because it's fun. You don't have to uh, make it a not fun. You, you, you have a good time, but you make sure that people know what to do when and if an emergency situation occurs. Now, how do we do that? What kind of training as biosafety professionals can we provide? Well, the first training that I love doing is tabletop exercises. What do I want? Let's, let's sit all at a table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a scenario, a what if scenario, okay? And you're going to have to kind of uh, uh, tell me what you would do. So first and foremost, here's the deal. Let's, 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 let's do this tabletop exercise. I'm gonna put my glasses on. You are a responsible official. You're a responsible official at your institution. It means you're responsible for the biological agents, okay? The scientist, okay, and this is a BSL-4, so we can actually, let's just make it a realistic for Pakistan. Let's say CCHF, okay? You have a scientist that's working with CCHF. The scientist shows up to work and reports a high fever, severe headache, has vomited several times, and is too weak to walk. Several of your staff are assisting this person. He tells you, he tells you about an unreported incident in the laboratory where two other scientists were involved. All three scientists who work in the laboratory were working with CCHF. Okay, so now what do you do? So what you do is you basically look at people and say, okay, you're, you, you've just got that call, what do you do? How are you going to respond? Oh, you're gonna, are you gonna take him to the hospital? Well, wait, you're gonna take him to the doctors? What are you gonna tell the doctors? You're gonna tell the doctors that it's possible CCHF? How are they gonna respond to that? How are you gonna transport the individual? What are you gonna do with the staff that's been working around this individual now and trying to help them out and cleaning up their vomit? What about the people at home? How are you gonna deal with this? So you spend about 15 to 20 minutes talking about what you would do, and then you go on to the next phase of the exercise. Well. The RO arranges for transport to a hospital, good. The RO is able to get in touch with one of the other scientists who is at home, uh-oh, and is feeling sick as well. The family of the scientist is concerned and wants to take them to another hospital. What do you do then? You have two scientists now, one that's already on the way to the hospital with CCHF, one that's at home and wants to go to another hospital that's different, with CCHF and possibly surprise the clinic or the hospital. Remember, hospitals are not typically prepared to handle the agents that you're working with in laboratory environments. They are prepared to handle things that are endemic, but if you've got some rare disease, a disease that you know is not something that you would typically find in Pakistan every single day, uh, hospitals may not be adequately prepared to respond to that. So. What are you going to do to make sure that this is happening? Now get ready, this is where it gets even worse. During the phone conversation, this is the final phase, with the scientist at home, the RO discovers the other scientist is on family vacation. 
And let's say they did go to Los Angeles. Unfortunately, the RO is, is not able to contact the scientist via cell phone, text, or email, but the staff reported that the scientist didn't fly on Delta Flow on Qatar Airlines, planned on renting a car, and visited major theme parks. What does your lab do now? Okay, so tabletop exercises are about kind of playing out a, a theoretical or conceptual emergency situation and really trying to understand what people would do and what the game plan would be. You're writing down what this game plan is and it'll actually help you develop an incident response plan for that particular aspect. This would be obviously a release of a particular agent or how you would respond to a laboratory acquired infection. So this is a incident response this is what you do before an incident response plan is developed. You get all your leaders together. You talk about what they would do, what they would want to do. You're taking notes, and then you develop your incident response plan based on the information that you're getting from all the individuals who would be a, a part of this tabletop exercise. Okay? I hope that makes sense. That's a, a, a one example of training. It's a, one form of training and what could be done. Now, another aspect that we do in labs is we sometimes talk about fires and people will talk about, well, you know, you should get a fire extinguisher and you should put the fire extinguisher or put the fire out with the fire extinguisher. I want you to be very, very careful with this. And here's why. Containment typically ends up building rooms that are fairly sealed or fairly well sealed for the most part. And fires, when they start, well, they sometimes starve. What do I mean by that? Fires require oxygen, as all of us know. Well, if you're in a room that's primarily sealed and a door is closed and the fire is burning, what happens when the fire uses up the air in the room? Well, it begins to smolder or smoke. And if you open a door into a room with a starving fire and a rush of oxygen hits that smoke, what do you think happens to that room? Well, it explodes. It actually has a big, what we call flashback or flashpoint or whatever it is. And every year, many, many firefighters in the United States and around the world die as a result of this type of incident. I think it's very, very important that we train our laboratory staff. If we're going to give them fire extinguishers and ask that they put out fires, I think it's very important that we teach them about this very serious issue, especially if we're working in BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs. These labs are fairly well sealed, and if a fire does begin to occur, they may think that the fire is going out, that they that that because it's smoking now that it's safe to enter the room. They open that door, that oxygen hits that fire, and then boom, a big uh, a combustible fire uh, or uh, a big explosion occurs. We need to make sure we train our staff how to respond properly to fires and how to put them out properly with fire extinguishers as well. Again, a very important point that we want to bring up and share, not only with first responders, but also with our own laboratory staff. Another thing that you need to prepare for are laboratory evacuations. Now, there are three types of evacuations you should prepare for. The first is what we call a non-life-threatening event, what we call a green or normal evacuation. An alarm goes off, uh, you call out, Somebody says, listen, there's not really a life-threatening event, but we do need you to get out of the lab. Uh, so you secure your agents, and then you go and you doff normally. Uh, so you take your, your, go through the normal doffing processes, and then you meet at a certain point on the outside, but always log and report the fact that you evacuated the laboratory environment. That's a green evacuation. A yellow evacuation is what we call a modified evacuation. Now it's a modified evacuation, which allows for you to ensure containment is kept. What do I mean by that? It means that basically you're going to evacuate in a modified fashion, but containment is still intact. So if there's, say, for example, an earthquake and there's an obstruction on the way that you would typically go out, well, you're going to go out a different way. Or let's say that you have been grossly contaminated. Well, you're going to remove your PPE in a unique way or in a different way to ensure containment in the lab and then you're going to exit the lab. Or let's say somebody is unconscious and you're going to move that person out of the lab. Well, you're going to do it in a modified fashion, which is going to still ensure containment occurs. The only time containment is breached is through a red evacuation, and that is when life is at risk. Now, 
You should stress with every single employee, no matter what level laboratory you have, that life is always more important than containment. You should stress that. Make sure they realize that. You cannot imagine, we have done exercises where there is somebody we simulate, somebody comes into the lab, they have a gun, they're shooting people in the lab, and people are running to the door, and then they get to the door and they start beaking and taking off their PPE to get out, even though people are being shot. No, listen, you need to empower people and teach them that life is always more important than containment, okay? Red evacuation means your life is at risk, get out of the lab right away, no matter what. We will breach containment to save life. Get out of the lab right away. All of these laboratory evacuations should be trained on uh, all the time, at least once a year. You should be training your staff to evacuate the lab in these three aspects every single year. Green evacuation, yellow evacuation, and red evacuation, okay, all right? Now, what happens if someone goes unconscious in the lab or someone has a seizure in the lab? What happens when that occurs? Well, there are two types of medical emergencies. One medical emergency is somebody is conscious. Let's say they slip, they fall, they hurt themselves, they're awake, they're conscious, they, they are aware of what's going on. You're gonna call for help, you're gonna try and minimize their exposure, and then you're gonna try to evacuate and decontaminate them using the yellow evacuation process, okay? Now, if someone is unconscious, we've got a big issue. The very, very first thing that you're going to do is you're gonna always call out for help. Now, this is critical. You have to understand this, it's very, very important. We will do simulation-based exercises all the time, and when someone sees somebody on the ground, the very, very first thing they do is they run over to them and they check to see if they're okay before they call out. Laboratories are confined spaces. What does that mean? That means that if something put that person on the ground, something put that person on the ground, and, um, and it's a chemical, or maybe it's electrical, or something else, I don't know, it could be a monkey with a wrench, doesn't matter. If you don't call out for help and you go over to assist and whatever put them on the ground puts you on the ground, that'll be two people on the ground. And two people on the ground down now with nobody on the outside of the lab knowing it could be hours or it could be days before somebody comes in to find you. So no matter what, because laboratories are confined spaces, it is absolutely critical, absolutely critical that you call out for help. Now, in a laboratory environment, the question will be, do you have life-saving technologies? Life-saving is different than life-sustaining. CPR is a life-sustaining. Life-saving is what we call an AED or a defibrillator. That is an automatic external defibrillator. These defibrillators are available. You can buy them and you can position them in your lab if you have the money to do so. And if you don't, that's okay. If you do not have a defibrillator, there's no need to do CPR in the lab. Why? Well, the emergency responders that are going to become or come to your organization are not going to go into a biological laboratory to take care of the person. So your job is to evacuate and decontaminate the individual as quick as possible, getting them to a position where when EMS arrives or the first responders arrive and they have life-saving technologies and AED, they can administer those things immediately. That is your job. You're not a medical doctor. You're not a medical professional. If you do CPR in the laboratory, EMS or the uh, ambulance is gonna arrive, they're gonna look at the laboratory, they're gonna say, I'm not going in there, you gotta bring them out. Once they bring them out, they're gonna say, well, this guy may be dirty, you're gonna have to undress them. The reality is, is that your job is to evacuate, decontaminate, and then wait for EMS to arrive doing CPR outside of the lab event. Now, if you've got a defibrillator, the next thing you do, if you've got a defibrillator, the next thing you do is you check for breathing. If they are breathing, you evacuate and decontaminate. If they are not breathing, if they're not breathing, then you're gonna defibrillate and then evacuate and decontaminate. Again, very, very important that you understand that if you don't have life-saving technologies, there's no need to check for breathing because you should be doing CPR outside of the laboratory environment. So get them out, then do CPR. You should be able to evacuate somebody within three minutes, that's the goal. Because the reality is, is that if somebody does not get CPR and defibrillation within four to six minutes, they begin to experience brain death, okay? So your job is to get them out in three minutes and start CPR right away until the emergency responders come. 
If you've got a defibrillator, which is a life-saving technology, then your job is to check breathing, and if they aren't breathing, to get that defibrillator on them right away to save their life. Remember, training matters. If you just have this as a plan and you don't practice it and you don't train on it, the reality is, is that you're going to have problems if and when someone in the laboratory goes unconscious. Okay? All right? Very good. All right. So how do we respond to a spill? Well, the reality is, is that right now the WHO has put out recommendations that if a spill occurs, get out of lab. Um, again, I'm going to strongly discourage that program or that adherence to that particular protocol. Um, people should be trained to respond to a spill. And the very first thing I want you to do is I want you to take a look at your SOP and I want to make sure that you have these five critical elements of SOP or of spill cleanups. The first is you should immediately let everyone know about the spill. You should immediately let everyone know about the spill. The second is that you should change your PPE, meaning you don't track the spill around the lab and you certainly don't track the spill outside of the lab. You always clean the spill from outside in, always clean the spill from outside in and allow for appropriate contact time. So you wanna allow for appropriate contact time, making sure that individuals or making sure that the agent you're working with and the disinfectant you're using is accurate, meaning you allow for appropriate contact time. Last but not least, you always log and report the spill incident. So always log and report the spill incident. The reality of the situation is, is that there are multiple ways of cleaning up spills, multiple. But the reality is, is that if you have these five elements of a spill cleanup in the SOP, your SOP is probably going to be extremely sound. Now, this is where we disagree with WHO. WHO says, look, if you've got a spill, get out of the lab. I'm saying as a behaviorist, that's ridiculous. First and foremost, if you're working with an agent that's bloodborne, fecal, oral routes of transmission, getting out of the lab is only going to potentially contaminate you and the outside of the lab because you may have the spill on you and you may not have assessed it. You may be in a panic mode. You may be getting out. Look, if you've got a spill in the biosafety cabinet, leave that biosafety cabinet running. Make sure you absorb, you, uh, use absorbent material to cover the spill. Pour a little bit of disinfectant on that absorbent material. Remove your gloves and put on new outer gloves um, and uh, recover any sharps with your forceps. If the spill is leaked beneath the work tray, carefully uh, raise the tray and apply additional disinfectant. Drain, uh, look, allow for appropriate contact time log and report the incident. If it's in a biosafety cabinet, it's not like I want you to celebrate over a spill, but thank goodness that it's in the uh, biosafety cabinet because outside the biosafety cabinet is when we've got a problem. If it goes outside the biosafety cabinet, you again, immediately alert your uh, coworkers. You remove any contaminated, potentially contaminated PPE. You get your spill kit, hang a spill sign, establish a spill perimeter, Soak towels with appropriate disinfectant, working outside in, cover that spill with those towels. Remove booties, don new PPE, allow for appropriate contact time, dispose of towels and waste biohazard bags, mop the area, remove booties and gloves, put on new PPE and log and report the incident. Again, the only time I would ever recommend evacuating a laboratory following a spill is if you're working with something that is spread through aerosol routes of transmission and you are not wearing a respirator while doing that work. This is very, very important. Uh, I understand that, that, that there are, respirators are not required in BSL-3 and you should be working in a biosafety cabinet when you're working with agents that are spread through routes of aerosol. But if a spill occurs outside of a biosafety cabinet and you do not have respirator protection and you're working with an agent that is spread through respiratory uh, means, then yes, I would I would evacuate a lab. But other than that, no. I think that a laboratory evacuation following a spill is excessive. I think it wastes time and resources. And I think rather than decreasing a risk, it actually could increase your risk because you're not in a good state of mind and you're panicking, you're exhibiting a panicking type behavior over something that you should be adequately prepared and protected from. Now, I do strongly recommend that every single laboratory have a spill kit. These spill kits should not be chemical spill kits, which unfortunately you see on the market today. 
A lot of people on the market today will have chemical spill kits and biological laboratories. I wouldn't do that. I strongly recommend having a checklist, uh, making sure that you put additional PPE in there, gloves and booties, that you have tongs, these big tongs like uh, the food tongs, that you have biohazard bags, at least three of them, and ble ble uh, beach towels that you could cover large areas with after you soak them with disinfectant, you cover large areas. Um, you should have your disinfectant, whether it's bleach or microchem, a uh, little Swiffer Sweeper or mopping thing that you can actually mop the area up and then dispose of in the autoclave when it's done. Uh, any bleach wipes that you want to put in there to, uh, to, to add with the disinfectant aspects and then zip ties for the biohazard bags because you don't want any spillage or anything coming out um, because you'll be working with uh, disinfectants and liquids uh, um, in the spill kit. But again, your, your spill kit is a very easy thing to assemble. Uh, you would just go out, grab those things, put them in a little kit, put a little sticker on it, seal it up, and put it in your your uh, your laboratory environment. Again, strongly recommend that every lab have a proper spill kit so that when a spill occurs, you only have to go one place to gather all the things you need to handle a spill. Otherwise, you're walking around the lab and the potential chances of tracking things around that laboratory uh, and making the spill area much larger grows because you're going everywhere to grab what you need for a spill. We don't need that. You basically step back, remove your, your gear, go to the spill kit, grab the spill kit, and the spill kit has your sign, has your extra PPE, has everything you would need to clean up a spill. So again, I would strongly recommend that you use a spill kit or develop a spill kit for uh, any spill situations that occur in the lab. Okay, so last slide, ladies and gentlemen, what happens if you get a needle stick or an animal bite? Well, very, very important that you understand time is critical. Time is critical. You shouldn't be talking on the phone and saying, hey, I just want to let you know I've got a needle stick or, hey, I just want to let you know that I, I've, I've, I've got an uh, animal bite. No, your heart is a pump. It's pulling and it's pushing, and your job is to minimize the quantity that you've been exposed to. That's the key. As quick as possible, you minimize the quantity of the agent that has been exposed to. So you're going to expose the wound. You're going to express the wound. You're going to express it, encourage it to bleed. Now, that is debatable. There are many people that say, you shouldn't do that. That could cause more damage than good. Listen, there's no doubt that if you're bit by a spider or a snake or you're working with some type of toxin that breaks down your skin, you should not express the wound. That is a guaranteed certainty. However, it is debatable whether or not expressing the wound works with a biological agent or not. Um, so it, it, for every article that says it doesn't work, you can find an article that says it does. The reality is, is you make the decision, but you should expose the wound right away, express the wound or encourage it to bleed, flush the wound for five minutes underwater. You're gonna wanna cover the wound. Then you're gonna wanna doff normally report for medical assessment because some of the things that we're working with requires immediate prophylactic treatment like HIV as a classic example and then log and report the incident. Now keep in mind that if you choose to use this protocol you may get questioned on the express the wound meaning I've heard that that's bad and you can say well you know it's debatable it can go either way um, but there's also uh, about covering the wound or not covering the wound of uh, the five minute flush. If you ever wash your hands, you don't wash your hands for 15 minutes. Um, why? Because you're trying to flush a biological agent off your hands. You're trying to flush things off your hand. Why would we make a 15 minute recommendation when we know we don't know for a fact whether it's beneficial for 15 minutes or not? If we don't wash our hands for 15 minutes, I'm certainly not going to recommend that we flush our eye for 15 minutes and I'm not going to recommend that we wash our hands for 15 minutes. In fact, when I've done my research and asked all these infectious docs what they would do and how long they would flush a wound that they knew had been, had, you know, had uh, some type of uh, biological introduction, like say, for example, what, how long would you flush a, a dog bite where you knew the dog had rabies? No doctor that I've run into said longer than five minutes. So five minutes is my recommendation. And if you actually look in the chemical industry, which is where this came from, they're now recommending five minute eye washes and flushes of, of chemicals that are non-irritant, uh, uh, meaning uh, I haven't met a biological agent that is an irritant. 
Um, so the reality is, is that five minutes is a very fair recommendation. Biosafety stole this from the chemical industry. The chemical industry used to have a 15 minute mandatory flush after all chemical exposures. They've changed that now. It's five minutes for non-irritant chemicals. If it's a chemical that irritates and a chemical that is oil-based, it may take up to 15 minutes to dilute the chemical enough where it's no longer causing a burn. So again, if it's a biological exposure, five minute flush is ample, okay? But be prepared. If you're gonna recommend this, be ready. Some people may argue with you on it and they may say, well, that's not what I'm hearing and that's not what's published. Be prepared on it, okay? Be prepared and say, well, where do you think that data came from? I'm not seeing any scientific data that's gonna recommend a five minute or 15 minute eye wash or a 15 minute uh, wound flush. Uh, there's no science behind that. And so why would we recommend or tell people to do something that isn't scientifically backed? Okay, now I'm gonna finish with a quote and it's a, a quote, uh, an old quote from uh, a former president here in the US, but I love the quote and I think it really sums up what uh, happens in humans. It says, when life does get tough and the crisis is undeniably at hand, when we must in an instant look inward for strength of character to see us through, we will not find or we will find nothing inside ourselves that we have not already put there. And I think this summarizes emergency preparedness and laboratory aspects. If you expect to respond well to an emergency situation and you have not prepared for it, you have not taken or done what it takes to invest in those working in the lab or to invest in individuals uh, who, who, who will have to respond to the laboratory emergency, then you're not going to be prepared and you should not, you should not expect a good end result because typically that's just not going to happen. Okay, all right. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm going to actually open up the question session. Question session, can, you can ask questions via the chat box, but at this point, what I'm gonna do uh, for the sake of you know privacy, if you guys do have questions or I'm going to end the recording session. I wanna say thank you to those that are watching the recording and thanks to all of you who have attended the session that may not have any questions. Really do appreciate all that you do and your service and biosafety and for the safety of others. Thank you very, very much. I hope I see you on the November Dinner Break series. And again, please share the opportunity. We have plenty of room. Uh, I don't think we ever got over 50 people today in this session, even though we had 177 registered. Do you know how many people just didn't show? That makes me sad. But if you do register, remember you're taking up a seat. So try your best to attend the session as well. If not, they will be recorded and posted on YouTube. I'm gonna post three today, so get ready. YouTube will have the workplace harassment uh, one, uh, life moment one, and uh, the emergency response one today as well. Take care of yourselves. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you next month. Inshallah, Allah, peace to you and your family.